Okay, we're ready to get started with the second talk of the session. Um, we have Daniel Porteous, um, who's originally from Melbourne, but currently living in Silicon Valley, to teach us how to make context managers. Hi, thank you everyone. So yeah, I'm Daniel. Um, just a bit about myself to start off with. So I'm uh, a production engineer at Facebook. I'm from Townsville, but I lived in Melbourne for university. Uh, these days I live in the Bay Area, California. So I always found talks on core Python features to be my personal favorite. Um, so I'm super excited to be giving my first talk at a conference about one of my favorite Python features, context managers. Um, for the sake of accessibility, you can download the slides um, using the link in the corner. All code is in text, um, and whatever images I have have alt text on them. If you can't see it, it's uh, deport.me slash pycon.pdf. I know that sounds like deport me, which I didn't intend to do because I'm a huge nerd. I was reading it as deport.me. Anyway, um, I hope no one in America takes this too literally. <laughs> uh, but I do have a subdomain called don't, so. <laughs> so Thank you, by the way, this is, because this is my first talk, I appreciate that you laugh at all my jokes. Uh, so this is the agenda for today. So we'll start with context managers, the, what they are and why we should use them. Um, we'll look at some core examples of context managers in uh, like Python standard libraries. We'll look at the hard way to write them ourselves um, before moving on to the easy way um, and what that entails. And then we'll look at some best practices, gotchas, and a few other things. So, this is gonna start out pretty simple and then end up covering sort of everything there is to cover about context managers. So it's okay if you get lost. Um, all my code snippets are up on my GitHub. The context manager docs are also excellent. Um, and I'll summarize the key takeaways at the end. So just hold on tight. Um, and please be nice to me. Okay, so lots of people I talk to um, don't know what context managers are by name, but pretty much everyone has used them. Um, it's sort of an instance of like some fancy nomenclature for something that you see every day. There'll be a bit of that throughout the talk, so I'll do my best to break down fancy sounding things into simple terms because that's how I learn things um, and I'm sure you'll appreciate it. So what are they? Um, anytime you see the word with, maybe accompanied by an as, you're looking at a context manager. So let's look at the classic example, like everyone's introduction into context managers, opening a file. So this is a simple example. It opens a file for you and gives you a handle to that file, F, as some sort of reference. Um, after exiting um, that block, F is closed, um, and like read and write operations to that handle will fail. So context managers manage your context, um, in this case, a file. Um, there's extra context on this that we'll come back to later. Uh, yeah, terrible. So um, in case it wasn't already planned, let's look at why we should use context managers. So for starters, you can't forget to close resources. Um, that I think was pretty clear just from the last example. Um, they can make your code much prettier. I know that's very subjective, especially if you were here for the last talk, which was all about art and stuff. Um, but I think they do. More concretely, you can um, very clearly visually see the lifetime of a resource um, within your code. Um, they can make more complex logic simpler, which we'll look at later. Um, like any other functional class, they're like these nice little bundles of abstraction that you can just use without understanding what's inside them. Um, so you can just sort of grab one, use it, um, without really having to understand how they work, which I think increases how easy it is to understand a new code base, um, and it can like increase quality without too much effort and more, um, which we'll sort of get to. So, uh, and to reference Python, um, here's import this, which I think other people have done today. I know Liam Calloway did that this morning. Um, he referenced import this this morning. Uh, so in my humble opinion, context managers tick these boxes. So let's look at our first example of a context manager that's in core Python. So, this currently does not use a context manager. We have a function called kill process. It takes in a process ID um, and it will try to kill it with a sig kill as the signal. Um, if the process can't be found, we just do nothing. We're like, okay, cool. The process is already gone, no worries. So 
in my opinion, that's a pretty verbose way to just say do nothing, like accept this error, do nothing. So let's look at the next slide. So inside context lib, um, there's this context manager called suppress. Context lib has all kinds of goodies in it. I highly recommend you check out the docs. Uh, it's all kinds of fun stuff. Um, suppress was only added in 3.6. 3.7 has this really good context manager that does nothing, which is actually surprisingly useful. So, um, <laughs> so check it out. Um, and here's the same example using suppress. So what we do is we pass an exception into suppress or a list of exceptions. And then if that exception is raised within the block, we just ignore it and keep chugging along. Um, very terse, very efficient, too few lines, right? So like you're really maximizing the amount of code you can fit on a screen. Um, cool. And here's the old one just for reference so you can sort of see the difference. Give me a second. Just consider how great that example just was. OK, so we'll move on to something else. So for starters, what is Threadpool Executor? Um, for all you Python 2 folk out there, this is a replacement of multiprocessing.pool.threadpool. It's pretty much just something that gives you a big bunch of threads, and you can submit jobs to them and um, do stuff like that. So what's happening in this code? I make myself a pool, and then I've got this dictionary of items. I submit jobs to the pool, and it'll be my func, which is just some random function and then these two arguments. And then I could do something like wait on the results or whatever, and then I'll shut down the pool. So notice that we manually create the pool, and then we have to manually shut it down, right? So this is clearly bad, because you know that because I told you in the comments up there. Um, and what's this? It's the good version. So you can see that firstly, it's shorter, and secondly, we're using our thread pool as a context manager. So we go with thread pool as pool, we do all the stuff that we want to do with it. And then once we exit that block, it will automatically get shut down. Um, and all that good stuff will happen. Obviously, you could just say, OK, well, just don't forget to close it. But um, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. Not to mention, sometimes you can have different exits from like your functions. So you might forget to do it in a particular place. So this is clearly like a nice way to do it. But you say that when it exits, um, things will happen. What is an exit method? Uh, We'll find out shortly. So if I was just to run this code, just to give you a quick example to make it more concrete. Um, sorry, I've got to like sort of cramp the code in to fit my agenda in. <laughs> um, and then a function like this, which is like noun is adjective, we would get output like this, right? And yeah, so I'm pushing my message. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, just as a fun little aside, notice that it's out of order because of threading and stuff, and not because of dictionaries, because dictionaries are actually ordered in 3.6. I know that's like a little tangent, but just fun Python stuff. Uh, so now let's look at how to write your own context managers. Yay, that's why we're here, right? So let's look at our very own context manager. So what does a context manager look like under the hood? Formally, a context manager is any class with a dunder exit and a dunder, sorry, dunder enter and a dunder exit method. Um, you have to define both. From now on, I'm going to just call them enter and exit methods to save myself the syllables. So, because we're all about efficiency here. Um, your init method is optional, sort of just like with any other class. Um, when you enter the block, enter will be called, and when you exit the block, exit will be called. Uh, if you're familiar with unit testing, which I hope you all are, because we're writing tests, right? Um, enter and exit, right? <laughs> enter and exit. I want to. I want to hear you say yes. <laughs> um, enter and exit are like ideologically similar to sort of like a setup and teardown method. So, what would this output look like? Um, it's pretty straightforward. I hope you enter inside the block and then exit, as you would expect. So, this context manager doesn't really manage a resource per se. Um, which goes to show that context managers can be used for a bunch of things. Um, really, any time you want to do something before and after a particular discrete event, um, this is a good way to go. You'll notice that in this example that there's no as keyword. Um, so let's go see how that works. So we've got, by the way, see, as neat as it gets, right? Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so in this slide, we're looking at how to get things after the as. Um, before going further to rattle on another, about another cool feature, f strings huh? in 3.6. Fancy new way of formatting strings. I recommend you get onto 3.6 up for this goodness. So 
This example uses as. Let's make it a little more obvious. So what you can see here is that what you're returning from your enter method is sort of what you'll get a reference to um, when you use your context manager. So data in with food context manager as data is a reference to self.data inside that class, right? So let's look at sort of how we can use that. Um, uh, and quickly, here's an example that um, uses init, by the way. So you can see in the previous slide, init just takes self. Here it takes a thing, and then you instantiate your context manager with a dictionary. This is just like any other class, so it shouldn't be too unfamiliar. Like that, yeah? Cool. Um, that's pretty much everything there is to writing context managers with classes, except for a few like exception handling things and exit methods, which we will come back to. But you're probably thinking, boy, that sure was a lot of work. Because um, <laughs> I know I was with all of those methods, like two to three methods just for that. Surely there's an easier way. Well, there is, because I told you there would be an easier way. So there's this thing called contextlib.contextmanager. Um, as it says in the docs, this function is a decorator that can be used to define a factory function for with statement context managers without needing to create a class or separate enter and exit methods, which is a whole lot of like baloney. Um, so really the takeaway is that you can make yourself a context manager without defining an enter and exit method. It's really just a thing, like a decorator that you whack on top of a generator to make it a context manager. But like, what, what now? Um, generators and decorators, so yeah, right? Um, before looking at an example for how we use this context manager decorator, we sort of need to set up the groundwork for um, what generators and decorators actually are, just like a little bit, so you are vaguely familiar if you're not already. So for decorators, we've just got a quick set of slides. Uh, generators will be more complicated, and but we'll get to those in a bit. So a decorator is essentially a function that takes a function and then returns a new function, right? So in this example, I take something func, and then I'm returning new func. And what new func does is it just calls func and then appends four exclamation marks to the end. Um, and then we return that function. Um, by the way, if you're like super interested in this, this has something to do with closures. I know I don't know anything about them, but um, if you're feeling academic, then that's a good place to go. So let's say I have this function called hello PyCon. It says, you know, that. Um, and I put this decorator on top, and I call it, what do we get, right? Say it with me. Hello, PyCon AU 2018. Wow, so enthusiastic. <laughs> uh, um, I think we can do that again. I'm going to be that guy. So OK, three, two, one. Hello, PyCon AU 2018. Wow, that was actually so much better. I'm, I'm proud of you guys. OK. Uh, so I hope, hopefully that sort of made sense. You don't really need to understand how they work. I just want to give you a little bit of information. Um, so this, with the at sign, is really just syntactic sugar for this, um, where you just, you know, it takes the hello PyCon function, you call the decorator on it, and then you get a new hello PyCon function. So if you were to call hello PyCon now, it would return it with all the exclamation marks. Um, cool, just give me a sec. Okay, so generators. Um, Matt Trentini this morning vaguely referenced generators, just, just like a little bit. Oh, sorry, that was yesterday. Um, he needs really good um, async IO MicroPython talk, so hopefully I'm not coming in totally blind. Um, and Liam Calloway name dropped them this morning too. So if you're like, hey, what were generators, then you're in luck because I'm about to sort of explain them. Um, hold on tight. So this is a generator. Um, essentially, it's a function that holds state. Every time you call it, it's going to generate the next value that it has available. So let's look at how that actually works. So if I create this generator, so gen equals first n5, when I call next on that generator, it's going to ask for the next value that it has available. Um, and it's going to like step through this loop. So the first one's going to print 0, right? And then the next time we call it, it's going to print 1. It's not going to print 0 again. Um, which it would do if it was return, right? Because you go return the first value, call it again, and it would just do the same thing, zero. It's, got, it's returned one because the generator sort of maintains state about where it's at. If you called it another three times, you would get two, four, sorry, that's not how numbers work. <laughs> two, three, four, 
And then if you called it again, you would get a stop iteration error because the generator would be like, hey, I'm out of stuff. I've got nothing left to give you. Cool. Um, you can also use them like this. So you can use it in a for loop and it will sort of do that work for you. It'll call it up to the point that stop um, iteration is raised and then done, right? So it is just going to print 0 through to 4. Now, so you've got a generator on the left. Each time you hit it, you get the next number. And then if we have some sort of regular function on the right, this one's a little different. It just produces that list from 0 through to 4. Um, however, if I was to call this um, print the sum, it's actually going to be the same value, right? So sum's going to take that list from the right function and consume it and sum them together. And then with the generator on the left, it'll do the same thing. It'll just iterate through it up until it can't anymore and sum them together. So we get 45. So the key difference is that generators sort of let you choose when to produce each item in your iterable, um, that thing you're iter iterating over. It's good for like lazy evaluation and stuff if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but if all that just flew over your head, don't panic. Uh, the basic takeaway here is that when you're writing a context manager decorate, context manager function, uh, just use yield instead of return. So <laughs> and that will be fine. Um, you don't need to know the intricacies here. The basic info is enough. So now that we have the groundwork, um, we can understand Context Manager, the decorator. So here's a little uh, Creative Commons image in the legal, like in the creative domain. So that makes legal happy. Um, <laughs> so let's put the two together. Finally, back to Context Managers after that little aside. So this is our old example showing um, how Context Managers work with the basic enter, inside the block, and then exit. So let's rebuild this with Context Manager. So I haven't included the import, but you would go from context lib include context manager. So the function my context manager underscores um, is a generator. It yields once. Uh, this is a requirement compared to those previous examples. Um, to turn this generator into a context manager, all we do is put on the context manager decorator. This builds the enter and exit methods for you, which I think is like freaking cool. Um, I think it's pretty amazing how all of these like crazy Python things, like generators and decorators and shit, just like sorry, um, <laughs> and things like that, come together to just you know give you that nice little mm, one-liner that gives you a, like a generator. Uh, sorry, a context manager. So let's step through this piece by piece and see how it works. So you can see the parallel between the two. Um, your enter method is essentially everything that you do before yielding, and then your exit method is everything you do after yielding which I think um, is very intuitive. Like It's a very intuitive way of um, constructing them. So let's go back to our food context manager. So this is our original, and then we'll rebuild it like this. So when you, so by the way, notice that these are functions that we put the thing on. So the function takes our variable, our argument. We print the data in it, yield the data, and then print the exit data. So um, it's the same example as before, pretty simple. Um, here's how these two relate. So whatever you yield is what you get after your as, yeah? And then here's how you initialize the stuff. So um, I think it's worth noting that when you, like, when you enter and print it, it's going to look like dairy as the key. And then when you exit, you're going to get both dairy and fruit as keys. Let's just, uh, let's just breathe, yeah, let's just stretch and recap. I know I need to relax, I'm freaking out, but that's okay. Um, so what have we learned? So context managers have enter and exit methods. Um, that's when you're making the class-based one. Your init method's optional. Uh, generators and decorators exist. And using these together, we can make the context manager decorator. It lets you easily turn a generator function into a context manager. So if you're overwhelmed at this point, that's fine. Um, if you're hungry for more, Graham Dumpleton, who has actually graced me with his presence in the front row, <laughs> has a talk about, quote, complex use cases for decorators and context managers tomorrow morning. So you might want to take a look at that if you're like hungry for more. Um, not, not that I'm done yet. So that's just me offloading responsibility for teaching things to others. That's a delegation. So, <laughs> so let's move on. We're almost there. So let's look at all the rest. Um, if you're still following me at this point, good job if you are. Here are some things you should know. So we'll start with scope. After a context manager is used, variables that you define in the context manager still exist. Um, so for this, in this example, content still exists at that print. So that's valid code. Um, I don't know if that seems obvious. It didn't to me when I first used these, because 
you sort of intuitively look at a new nest, like a new indent as a new scope. But that's not the case. Context managers do not create a new scope. Um, this, on the other hand, is not valid. Um, but it's not valid because F doesn't exist. It's invalid because F has been closed and the read won't work. So you're going to get a value error for trying to read the file after it's been closed from the context manager. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. But this is what we want, right? This is the context manager doing its job because we want F to be closed once we've exited the block. Okay. So next we'll see how to handle exceptions in the exit method. Um, previously we showed exit with this signature. Um, that asterisk EX, EXC just consumes all the remaining arguments, which we've ignored. So if we expand it out, it looks like this, right? So you get the type of an exception, an exception, and an exception traceback. This exception is if an exception is raised inside the block of the context manager, your exit method has the opportunity to do something with it and deal with it, right? Um, so but there are some things to think about here. There are some gotchas. So if you want to ignore the exception that was raised, you can just return true from your exit method and it will get ignored. If you want to raise the exception, you can return false or just do nothing, um, and that's the default behavior. It's important to note that you shouldn't explicitly re-raise the exception because that creates some like crazy like nested exception thing that you don't want to do. So um, this is sort of the way you go. So for example, I could have this code where if an exception occurred within my context manager, um, I can react to it. So if exception is none, this code won't trigger and we'll just keep on going. But if there was an exception, I'll print oh no, and then do some call for help function, which could be, I don't know, get like an engineer who knows what they're doing in. <laughs> And then you can return false to re-raise the exception. So you've done something to deal with it, and then you get to see it. Um, and of course, you don't actually need to return false. So using this, we can actually implement suppress, uh, which we looked at earlier. This is pretty much how suppress is actually implemented in context lib, um, which is what's so great about Python, is that the library code is actually still quite understandable. So if your exception wasn't none, um, meaning that an exception happened, and your exception was a subclass of the exceptions that you put in your, like you started it with in your init method, then um, the exception will be ignored. That Boolean will resolve to true, and then you'll just ignore the exception. So I think that's pretty neat, right? Um, well, Excel's meant to say that by highlighting stuff. So moving on. And then finally, we'll look at how we do that exception handling inside context managers with this decorator. So the examples that I've shown don't actually have um, you know, they don't actually handle the exceptions. So what do we expect will happen here? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Well, like five seconds, because I'm running out of time. So if we look at the output of this, what we're going to get is we're going to get before, and then we're going to get an exception, right? Because we've yielded, we've tried to print one divided by zero, which is not like, which will cause a black hole, so we don't do it. And then we get this trace back, right? So if we want to deal with it, Here's our old code, which threw the error. We can get some exception handling like this. So we'll print before, we'll try to yield. If we get an exception, we'll print oh no, and print the exception message. And then finally, this is just a standard try except finally, we can print after. So um, notice that, I know this is confusing, but unlike class-based context managers, you have to explicitly re-raise the exception if you want it to happen again, unlike returning um, true or false. So I'm sorry about that. That's just how it is. <laughs> and then you're going to get it like this. So division by, oh no, division by zero after. Oh, we made it. Excellent. Wow. Uh, we almost made it. We've just got a few other things. So one more time, we just covered uh, context managers in the standard library, our own context managers the hard way, decorators and generators, the easy stuff, and then all the rest is coming up. Oh, well, we just did all the rest. Now there's like the last little bit of all the rest. So just some best practices to remind you. Don't explicitly re-raise in your exit method. In context managers, you do have to re-raise. Um, and finally, something we didn't talk about is know the roles of init and enter, because they both sort of get called when you use your context manager. Um, the takeaway is don't make init too expensive, computationally expensive, um, because there is the option that you could make a context manager but never use it, um, which is extra possible in 3.7 now that we have null contexts that do nothing context manager. Um, and then some other possible uses is you could, I don't know, do an event and then log based on what happens inside that block. Um, something I was doing is you enter your context manager, you spin up a remote host, 
it gives you a handle, like a host name, you run commands against that host, and then once you're done, it'll destroy the host at the end. Well, not physically, but you know what I mean. Um, and more, um, I'll leave it to your imagination what we can do. So to paraphrase Tim Peters incorrectly, um, context managers are one honking great idea. Let's use more of those. Um, before moving on to questions, I'll let you guys know that I have a whole bunch of pins slash buttons with this on the end of it. This is a very cute drawing by my friend Fatima, a Twitter handle attached, please go follow. You can come grab one of them after the talk from me. I uh, have like, ugh, like 30, so <laughs> don't everyone come, but please do come. Uh, okay, questions? Oh, cancel that, not questions. Thanks to people. Thanks to my uh, fellow Facebook folk for watching all my dry runs and stuff, because when I first did it, I was like, oh yeah, it's done, and then it was 11 minutes long. So <laughs> uh, to my friends for moral support, the PyCon AU team for putting this awesome event together, and all of you lovely people for laughing at my stuff and hopefully following along with what I was saying. Uh, yeah, questions and stuff. We have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, just raise your hand. Hi there. Um, great talk. I was just wondering, with the um, with the decorator usage, you had that yield statement in there. Mm. What happens if that function yields more than once every run? Um, Is that defined behavior? Is that something you'd ever want to do? Or No, that's illegal behavior. Um, I haven't actually experimented with what happens. I'm fairly sure the answer is you'll get an exception. Um, but in the docs, it says that you need, they use some fancy like singular iterative generator or something. But um, I'm fairly sure it doesn't work at all. So. And thanks for saying my talk was nice. <laughs> Hi. Uh, when we write our own context manager, uh, where do we write uh, the cleanup function to clear all these resources? Is it should be written in the exit function or? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, exit method should clean up whatever was established in your enter method. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, it's just how context managers differ from decorators in general. Because um, I realized Everything that was done by context manager could just be done by a decorator. And that's an excellent question and something that um, I didn't have time to touch on. But they are very similar ideologically. And there is a thing, if you go read context libs docs, there's a thing called context decorator. And then you can make context managers decorators and vice versa, I believe. So the answer is yes. You can, whatever you do with a context manager, you can do with a decorator. Um, it's really a matter of taste. I think context managers are sort of simpler to think about. Thank you. I think I'll need to do more reading on it, but... Yeah, <laughs> the docs are great. I know I've said that like five times, but they're really good. Okay, we still have a couple of minutes. If there's more questions. Great questions so far. You haven't made me look too dumb. Hi, any, are there any gotchas with writing functions that can be used both as a context manager and not like the open function? Uh, so whether it comes with a width before it or not? I imagine probably not, right? Um, like there are a lot of things, like in Python 2, for example, Socket was not a context manager, and lots of people would like to use it as one, and therefore they made it one in Python 3. Um, I really don't see many examples where it's detrimental to have them as both, assuming that they're not implemented erroneously. Um, I'm sure someone can prove me wrong with an example from history, but I, I think context managers are great, so <laughs> use them where possible. Does anyone have a last question? Hi, uh, great talk, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to follow up and ask what the use of the null uh, context manager was. Oh, it's, it's amazing, it's seriously so good. Um, <laughs> like, it's essentially, if there's some condition where, let's say you've got a function that takes an argument called ignore exceptions. Um, you, if that is true, then you'll want to use the suppress context manager on whatever exceptions you want to ignore. But if it's not true, you don't want to use that context manager. So previously, it got really awkward where you'd have to go, if um, ignore exceptions, do the whole thing with that with, else, and you sort of have to re-implement the behavior. 
These days what you can do is you can go if ignore exceptions, context manager equals suppress, else context manager equals null context, and then you can use it in the same like code structure, except when null context is happening, it just doesn't do anything. So it's just sort of like something to make your code structure nicer. That's a 3.7 feature, so you really need to get cutting edge to use that. Thank you. That's all the time that we have. Um, please thank Daniel for his talk.